he says, you will serve as a minor assistant to the Wardens of Threshold. Wink, wink, nod, nod. And this group is referred to as the Threshers. Wink, wink, <laughs> nod, nod. Welcome to Casuals of Runeterra Book Club. I'm your host, Ryan, and today we're talking about the novel Runation, uh, specifically the prologue, chapter one, two, and three. So what is this style? What is this new episode that we haven't had before? Well, it's new because this is the first book we've wanted to cover for League of Legends. Uh, and we want to do it in a book club style. So this is meant for people who are reading along, like most book clubs. Um, if you want to follow as we go, that would be cool. Uh, if you're not reading the book at all, well, this is just kind of a review of what's happening, right? Kind of keep you in the loop without bogging you down with, you know, 400 plus <laughs> pages of content. So Hedge is not here, as you may have noticed, uh, but he will be joining us in subsequent episodes randomly. Uh, to give his two cents and kind of give his thoughts on the events leading, leading up to wherever we are in that episode. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. But one thing you're familiar with is housekeeping. So up top, you can listen to us everywhere. Uh, contact us at podcastcore at gmail.com. Visit us at podcastcore.com for all of our info. Follow us on any platform you prefer or all the platforms because that helps us with discoverability. So we appreciate that. And then leave a like, a comment, and a short review because we appreciate those uh, and that feedback. Uh, the easiest way, though, is word of mouth. Tell one friend to prepare to be judged by listening to the Casuals of Runeterra podcast. So kind of an introduction to this book is its author. So it's written by Anthony Reynolds, who is also a writer on the Riot MMO team, which is a big deal, right? Because obviously MMOs have a lot of lore. So to have someone both writing the book or multiple books, we don't know if he's working on another one, and also directly working with the team, you have that connection, right? And gives you gives you more of a thread to pull on um, as they flesh out that game. But what about the contents of the book? Well, the contents of the book is essentially a prequel to the events of our Sentinels of Light content. So if you've listened to that, then cool, you're kind of prepped for what's coming. If not, you don't really need to listen to those episodes. We would appreciate if you did. Uh, but this is a prequel, right? And some people have different views on prequels, whether they matter or not, because I know how it's going to end. Classic like Star Wars Rogue One. But that was a good movie, right? Uh, it's about the journey, not the destination. So kind of keep that in mind and keep an open head as we go through this. And you should have a good time. So let's get into it, because there's a chunk of information, very important in the first bit of uh, this story. So we start with the prologue. All right, so in the prologue, we start with a ceremony called the choosing. So this is where the brightest minds in the Blessed Isles get together and they choose their apprentices um, for the future. And we're introduced to Ehrlich Grail, a confident, proud, quiet, and jaded young student born to a commoner family uh, of pig farmers. And he's kind of waiting for his name to be called. In his eyes, he has one person that he wants to choose him. And this is Hyark Malgurza, who's known as the master of the key as his potential teacher, right? So she calls a name. Unfortunately, it's not his name. And this kind of strikes him as a cold reality of the situation and it you know stuns him and he's like well crap and this shot continues because other names continue to be called and they're not his until he's the final student standing there and everyone is on the stage looking down at him so bardic who's the leader of this ceremony is looking down at Ehrlich with a disgust grin on his face and he says you will serve as a minor assistant to the Wardens of Threshold. Wink, wink, nod, nod. And this group is referred to as the Threshers. Wink, wink, <laughs> nod, nod. <laughs> Can't give you any more of a hint than that. And they're considered the lowest of the low. And what they do is they patrol the lowest depths of the vaults. 
And Bardock says his reasoning for this sentencing is to instill some humility and hopefully some empathy into the young man. But Ehrlich himself is not convinced, but he's resolute to do his time and also not break while he's doing it and never forget this insult that has happened today. So this is the opposite effect <laughs> of their goal, unfortunately. But this does fit very well into the character that we know as Thresh in the future. So a little bit of foreshadowing there on those developments. Then we shift over to Callista and Viego. Another two characters, very important to this whole scenario. Um, and they're arriving at the king's pronouncement ceremony at the hallowed sanctum of judgment. And Callista's standing there. She's poised. And Viego is kneeled and kind of huffing out of breath. And Viego, we find out, is 21 at this moment. And he's also Callista's uncle. Whoa. And although she's older than him, it's more like she's his older sister, right? So we know that they have a close relationship from the start. And Callista's father was the first, technically, <clears throat> in line for the throne. But as these stories go, Game of Thrones style, he has an unexpected death. And this results in the quote unquote honor being passed down to Viego. So at this ceremony, we have hooded masked priests and they form this circle around the blade of the king. This is known as sanctity. And Viego kind of asks Callista to tell him of what his father's last words again. And his father was her grandfather, uh, known as the Lion of Camivore, a very prestigious king um, in the lineage. And although he's told her uh, that Viego's not fit to rule, and she must always stay close to rule at his side as his right hand. She lies to Viego. She protects him, and she says that he said you would be a great king. And this, along with her promising, you know, to always be there for him and to stay by his side verbally, uh, she gives him what he needs to summon the courage to undergo the test. So, what's the test? So the test is Viego has to grab the sword. Pretty simple, but there's two outcomes. He will either be judged worthy or he will be killed <laughs> instantly. And that's unique. So the ceremony is designed in a way where it's set up to either be a celebration <laughs> or a funeral. Uh, and Viego's like, all right, cool. He steps up, puts his both hands on the hilt of the sword. You've seen the sword in art before. It's a pretty big sword. And then his eyes widen, his pupils contract, and he begins to scream. So a hell of a way to start this story off. And also a bit of foreshadowing to something we'll talk about in the later chapters. So don't forget that part. We move on to chapter one. And this gives us a bit of a time leap. Uh, we jump forward 18 months and Viego's now king. And he's married to his wife, he's old. So we get a resolution from the prologue of what happened at that ceremony. We then follow Callista. We follow Callista uh, immediately after victory in battle, and she mentions how you know it was tough to convince Viego not to join in the battle because Camavorn, Camavorian kings are known to be warrior kings. They fight alongside their people, and since he's yet to do that, and yet to have an heir, she convinces him. Listen, you need you have a duty to the people as king to have kids. That's kind of common. Uh, and Isolde, who is on her side, so his wife, together they're able to convince him, calm his pride, and change his mind. So we get a hint here kind of as, okay, who's young King Viego? He's prideful, kind of standard, uh, but he does listen to these two women by his side, which is good because both of them have good heads on their shoulders. So now we go back to Callista, who is the general of the Camivorian army, and she's exhausted and kind of gathering herself, and she regroups with her number one captain, Ladros. Ladros, a name you've heard before if you listen to our other um, related content, uh, and a card in Legends of Runeterra that has been a nightmare for many, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> so Ladros is described as a massive man, Standing well above the next tallest soldier, he's tan-skinned, covered in pale scars, and due to being commoner-born, 
uh, only wearing baked leather as opposed to armor like the rest of the soldiers. So we can immediately see a divide and kind of a caste system even within the military here. And he stands there and he's holding the severed head of the Santorosian king. Santorosian, I'm going to be saying that a lot and I might mess it up, so please bear with me. <laughs> Uh, but this is the key to what ended the battle in their favor. So they were successful. And although physically he's an intimidating and capable person, Ladros is a quiet dude. Uh, but he's a loyal soul, and Callista puts a lot of trust in him, as Viego does in her. So she kind of transfers that over. Um, next, we have them then shifting to paying respects to the fallen. And then they celebrate with the soldiers to kind of raise their morale post this victory uh, and the losses suffered. And Callista mentions that, you know, despite being highborn, this is where she feels most at home is parting with the commoners. Uh, this is where she's comfortable. And this becomes a theme throughout. As we go into more chapters about we get some introspective uh, concepts from Callista on her view of what's going on as being a part of the Camivorian army and their conquest. Uh, so after this, we have some knights ride over, and the man she's engaged to is there. Uh, he comes over where Callista is teasing Ladros uh, with praise, and we find out that it is Hecram. Now, Hecram's described as a handsome man having a regal and former presence, uh, and this immediately shifts the mood and you can tell there's a bit of tension between Hecram and Ladros. They're kind of setting up something here in this first chapter. Um, but after, you know, after this, although Callista and Hecram have only been engaged, they've met two or three times, which happens a lot when you're betrothed to someone else um, of in like the royalty tier of things. Uh, he asks her, hey, can we take a walk and talk? Um, he has a few things to get off his chest. So they stroll through the battle, which is not the, base scene, the best scenery, to kind of have like an impromptu coffee date. <laughs> and he tells her that, you know, he's been hearing some rumblings amongst the higher cast of people. And they talk about, you know, how well liked she is by so many of the common folk. And there's fears that she might intend to overthrow the throne. And she laughs this off, right? Because she doesn't like to do the whole royalty shenanigans and politics. And she tells Hecram that, you know, she doesn't really care what other people think. She's loyal to Viego and beyond just being king. That's her little bro, right? And he apologizes. You know, he apologizes and he says, you know, I must go. Uh, to ensure that the conquered city, everything's kind of filed away because Viego made a specific demand not to sack the city, which, you know, props to him, I guess, a, a little bit of positive imperialism. <laughs> then we have them return to the others. Hecram rides off and then Ladro spits on the ground and makes a sly comment about Hecram's riding skills. And then the chapter ends. So chapter two takes us to a feast in the Santorosian uh, his town or city. And this is where the, they continue the celebration of the recent victory. So we've moved from the battlefield to the actual city following where Hecram was riding to. And we get some internal dialogue here from Callista. And she's thinking about, you know, her duty as being highborn uh, and how grateful she is that Hecram was chosen for her to wed, you know. She has no choice, but the guy she chose is only a few years older than her, um, which is a big deal considering monarchies. If you've watched any other type of content, uh, usually it's like an old guy preying on a young girl for, you know, obviously the royalty reasons. Um, but he's the youngest ever grandmaster, and he's part of the highest knightly order, the Iron Order, who's known as being the most wealthy as well. So she got a good end of the deal here um, regarding her situation, and she enjoys his company, um, but she hates the atmosphere around him and around uh, her duty, right? She finds it obscene that in this moment they're dining um, served by recently conquered citizens, and these citizens are trembling in fear because they have no idea what's next, right? They don't know that Viego is trying to be 
um, as lenient as possible considering the considering the situation. So they're fearing for the worst. Um, and this we now get a introduction of a, the attendants and who in the knightly order is here because Viego's not here yet. He'll be here soon. Don't worry. Um, so we start with Lord Ordano uh, of the Knights of the Azure Flame. He's described as tall and a severe person. We have Lady Aurora, Grandmaster of the Horns of Ebon. She's known as boisterous and confident, which Callista likes. It kind of fits her personality as well. And finally, we have Sayadana, Grandmaster of the Golden Shield, known as a heavy, piggish man. <laughs> and during the festivities, we do have a drunk Sayadana approaching Hecarim and Callista with some outspoken negative views on Callista's increasing the proficiency of her soldiers from lowborn origins. So this is, you know, a repeat of what Hecarim told her was being whispered about in the higher upper echelon. And she counters, you know, reminding him that his order, the Golden Shield, fought against the crown in the past. And Hecarim even intervenes, telling him, you know, you might want to sober up before you say something irredeemable. And this is cool, right? Because usually with these kind of setups with, between Hecarim and Callista, Hecarim being on, being both, you know, his, her fiance and also a knightly order, you would think he, he would be playing both sides. But he's fairly on, at least as we know now, he's on Callista's side, right? He wants to support her and he wants to marry her. Um, just as much as she doesn't mind being married to him. So now we have the king and queen finally arriving at the feast in dramatic fashion. And through Callista, we do learn more about Isolde. She's also low, lowborn. She was just a seamstress, and she's not from Camivore, which went against everything in a king marriage tradition, right, that we know, um, like I said, from other contexts. And this causes the aristocrats to view her as unsteady and unseemly. And that's like, like, like I said, she goes against all traditions, right? But she takes pride in it. You know, she takes a pride in her origins and those didn't affect Viego's unrate, unwavering adoration for her. Like he likes her just as much. So we have a lot of support structure here, um, which is definitely an unconventional king, queen, right hand situation um but that doesn't mean everything's going to be roses as you may know if you've listened to our other content so viego arrives the first thing he does is he proceeds to toast to the audience for the victory and he conducts you know a theatrical reveal of the artifact which guided their imperialism <laughs> quote unquote and this is along the help with uh, his advisor nuno necrit uh, sound familiar uh, props to Necrit for getting a name drop here. Uh, there's been a joke that he showed up in the lore more than some other characters at this point, uh, especially when it comes to Runation, because he also makes an appearance in the game that came out recently. So he's doing some big things, man. And then he says, uh, quote, our founding ancestors, the twins, Camor and Noble Avra, smile upon us. And then he reveals Mikhail's chalice to the surrounding onlookers and this is not an in-game item uh we do have mikhail's crucible which is a support item in the game so that still is a callback there and then we wrap up this chapter with callista kind of internalizing some of her disdain for imperial conquest in the history of camivore so i just want to read some quotes out here uh, from her how long has our noble conquest culture been corrupted how long did it take for our quest to become little more than convenient and transparent excuses to plunder and raid, to kill, claim fertile lands, and steal from our neighbors. How long before they were used to justify invading in any city, state, and nation that would add wealth and esteem to the kingdom of Camivore? So we have this ongoing narrative where she's conflicted with her place in all of this, but also, even though she's highborn and you know part of the lineage, she doesn't have as much power to change everything by herself, right? This then leads to a realization and a bit of foreshadowing. Once again, if you know some of the story, uh, quote, today had been necessary and yet 
She looked around her. The knights and nobles hardly looked like people at all. The unnatural glare from above leached their faces of color, making everyone appear as vile specters and ghouls. A cold shiver of dread ran through her. And that's how we end chapter two. So we finish the day with chapter three. And this is something straight out of like a chaotic Game of Thrones episode. So prepare yourself. So this in, disinterested in the festivities, we have Callista kind of chilling and she notices that two servants who are oddly calm compared to the rest of the nervous servants that we've talked about previously. And she feels something is off. She's like, something's not right. So she grabs her spear and she begins to walk with like determined strides through the halls towards where the king is. But she's trying not to co cause an uproar. And as she does this, she makes eye contact with the king's bodyguard. We get a name here. His name's Vask. And tries to convey her thoughts to him through body language to not, you know, disrupt anything. And as the first servant makes their way over to the king to pour some wine, she notices that a dark ribbon is swirling around their hidden hand. And Vask can't see that hand. So without a change in her demeanor, Callista hurls her spear and catches the assassin right as they turn square in the chest and it instantly kills them, right? Okay, cool. Well, the room then erupts in chaos because no one really knew anything was happening. And the other assassin that she clocked dips into the crowd, conjures his own weapon and begins dis dismantling the soldiers effortless, effortless, effortlessly. Sorry, <laughs> I had a hard time saying that word, which is ironic. Um, and he turns to dart towards where Vask is and the king, but Vask, knowing he's unmatched compared to what these assassins who are clearly trained are doing to the rest of the guard, he puts himself in the blade's path. And he grabs the attacker and nods to, you know, Callista, who's shocked to deal the killing blow. So although the assassin kills Vask, he's able to put them in a situation where she can get the assassin as well. Um, and pretty much save the king and queen. So the man does his job, right? That's It sucks, but that's what he signed up for. Unfortunately, though, Callista notices there's another suspicious person ducking off in the crowd, and she knows her. So the guards rush to apprehend this new guy and overwhelmed get overwhelmed by the individual because they also have dark blades and skills and just put them in their hands and they went to work. So they finally are able to, you know, after a couple soldiers fall, they beat him up and hold him down. Uh, and the assassin launches a dagger over to where the king is. Callista tries to deflect it, and the dagger ends up embedding itself really close to where the queen was sitting. But from her first glance, everything looks like they got lucky. And she demands now that the restrained assassin be taken alive for questioning because she had to kill the other two based on the events, right? Viego has other ideas. <laughs> so Callista keeps yelling at him, you know, we need to keep him alive. But Viego's now in a fit of rage and he's stalking over to where this man is and he's demanding that the guards get back from him and he summons sanctity out of nowhere, right? Out of thin air and subconsciously erects an invisible barrier so that not Callista or the soldiers can intervene or stop him from what he plans on doing. Once he gets over there, he yells in anger, quote, I am the king of Camivor, the greatest nation this world has ever seen, and you are nothing. And then he takes both hands and he slams that blade down, instantly killing the man, and everyone in the room freezes. Not magically, <laughs> they just freeze in shock of the, the span of time where this craziness has gone, gone on. But suddenly we have Isolde break the silence by calling out to Viego, and she has blood on her hands, and we see the blade in the chair disintegrate, but with a slight graze on her shoulder, she begins, it begins to blacken her flesh and spreading, and then Isolde's eyes roll back into her head, and Viego lets out a scream. So you remember the uh, little bit of foreshadowing I talked about in the prologue, um, with his eyes widening and the screen coming out. So a little neat, neat narrative there. And that's where we're going to end for this episode of the book club. So thoughts so far. Um, good, good. It's pretty gripping at this point. Once again, you know, all the knowledge I have 
of what happens in the future didn't impact how much I enjoyed this read. I really like that Callista is the kind of main focus so far um, through her eyes because we get some perspective on someone involved in an imperialist nation that doesn't really want to be there, but is so high up and has, you know, a lot of influence on the king and Isolde that she feels she can make a difference there, right? The difference from within. Uh, but obviously we'll find out in later chapters how that goes. Uh, so, so far I'm having a good time and hope you are too. As always, thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with the next book club episode. And as Hetch would always say, take care, everybody.